should say top ten. Come on. You did, did you set up the room next door by chance? Or? I didn't. Mm. Should I? Uh, Probably. I, I'd rather it be and not use. Okay. Well, let me get through the mic check here. And yeah, sure. You tell me. You have to turn the lights. No, all the lights are on. And I got to turn TVs on. Start with the podium, check one, two, one, two, three, check, check, one, two, three, one, two, three. Mic number one, check one, two, three, mic number one, check, check, one, two, three. Mic number two, one, two, three, check one, two, three, mic number two. Three super mic, mic number three, super mic, check, check. President mic, mic number four, check, check, one, two, three, mic number four, pres mic. Let's see if it's a little louder. Mic number four, check, check, one, two. Seven thirty start on mic number five. Check, check, one, two, three, mic number five, seven thirty start. Welcome to the mic check. Mic get it? Mic number six, last one. Check, check, one, two, one, two, three, mic number six. All those sound good, Robin. Uh, I'll be right down to get the other TV for the overflow room. But for now, I'm going to mute. You tell me if it is muted. Muting in three, two, one.
should do speak to WWE. Just This evening we have Glenn Boba, trustee, Jay Grover, trustee, Sherry Steffens, trustee, Jude Kuhn, our district clerk, Dr. Brian Graham, superintendent, 
I'm Ashley Dreyer, Board President, Sue Marston, Vice President, Danielle Bruno, Trustee, Michael Loria, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum, Staff Development, and Human Resources, Cheryl Cardone, Assistant Superintendent of Pupil Personnel Services, and Dr. Ruby Harris, Assistant Superintendent for School Business and Finance. Just a couple of announcements. If you could silence your cell phones, please. And uh, just take note that there's an emergency exit directly behind me and directly in front of us um, as well. So if I could have a motion to approve the agenda for March 13th, please, 2023. I'll and a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. I just also want to make a note that Joy is excused this evening as well. All right, if I could have a motion to approve the minutes from February 13th, please. And a second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. We have a couple ambassadors with us. One from, if we could have our middle school ambassador come up to introduce, please. Good evening, Board of Education, Dr. Graham. We would like to introduce Reagan Pankow to come up and talk about the fun activities that we have going on at the middle school. Hello, my name is Reagan Pankow. I am the publicity supervisor in the VCMS Student Council, and I have a committee that makes posters that we hang up in the hallway. In the past couple of weeks, the Student Council has been planning the Shamrock Shuffle and a Spirit Week. These are the things that have been included in the posters that my committee and I have made. At the Shamrock Shuffle, there will be an inflatable, a DJ, and a cotton candy machine. The Spirit Week days will be March through January Monday, where the students dress up like a surprise guy or wear animal print. For Tuesday, we will have a hat day. Wednesday is Susan Day. Thursday will be Couch Potato Day. And Friday, students will wear their St. Patrick Day's Day Wear or Green. Christensen and this is my brother Michael. This evening we would like to speak to you about the happenings at the high school. To start us off, today was the first day of spring sports and everyone I talked to was really looking forward to competing this upcoming season. There are so many sports kids can participate in during the spring including boys and girls lacrosse, baseball, softball, track and field, and boys tennis. Next week is Clash Week and everybody is really looking forward to it. Every day of the week, there is a theme that you are to dress up as to score points for your class. On Friday night, there is a salsa dance being held beforehand by the, by the foreign language department. During, you will learn to salsa dance with professional instructors and get La Divina tacos. This evening is going to take place, this event is going to take place right before the Clash of the Vikings event. It is very exciting and everyone gets really excited to score points for their class and win money for their class's account. A huge congratulations goes out to all the DECA competitors who attended DECA States last week. The team of Eden Johnson, Natalie Cordero, and Andrew Burke are moving on to the International DECA competition in Orlando, Florida next month. This past weekend, the Grand Island Chess Club took first place in both the USCF rated and unrated sections at this month's Western New York March Madness Scholastic Chess Tournament held in Lackawanna. They competed against many schools and the individuals placed very well. The Celebration of Inspiration event will be taking place on Thursday, April 27th. This award is a great way to honor a teacher or school staff member who has made a big impact on your life. And finally, this winter, Michael and I were both a part of the indoor track and field team. At the Section 6 State Qualifier Meet, I placed first in my event and got the MVP of the field honor. And Michael placed third, leading us to both qualify for the NISFA Indoor, Stack, Indoor Track State Championship, making Grand Island history by being the first ever sibling duo to go to the state meet together in the same event. 
studying health science or kinesiology, and I haven't picked what college I'm going to go to yet. <laughs> I'm Eden Johnson. I am also undecided, but I plan on studying law. I am John Paul Sobleski. I'm planning on studying engineering at either UB or RIT. Hi, I'm Matthew Rizzo, and I'm planning to pursue a doctor of pharmacy with a PharmD degree, and I'm still undecided, but uh, I'm still waiting to hear about either University of Pittsburgh or University of North Carolina. I'm going to attend Houghton University. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to major in, but I was accepted to the London Honors Program, so I'll be spending my second semester in London. Uh, my name is Megan Pinzel, and I'm undecided for where to go, but I'm going to study in the field of architecture. Good evening. My name is Reagan Fast. It is still difficult to believe that I am here, and I am honored to be here with my esteemed classmates. Six years ago, I was in a self-contained special education class, and because of my teacher, Mrs. Maving, and Mrs. Anderson, who is now my personal aide, and too many people to name, many who are in this room, I was supported in a way that allowed me to be part of the community, and to not just succeed, but excel. I am excited to tell you that I have been accepted as a biology major at the University of California, Davis, Texas A&M University, the University of Buffalo, Rochester Institute of Technology, and Arizona State University. I am still waiting to hear from some other schools that I have applied to, but I am very happy with the options I have right now. I know that 100% independence is a long-term goal that I may never achieve. But I will continue to work hard and not squander the education you provided me. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. We do have uh, two action items on our agenda. So for A, we do have a proposal for our school district calendar for the 2023-2024 uh, school year. So we're actually asking for action on A and also B. We are asking for a new textbook adoption for our women's study course, which is brings us a true story of life behind the veil in Saudi Arabia. If I can have a motion for A and B, please. But is there a uh, conflict of all those? <laughs> no, no, no. Alright, no, just no, wanted to make sure we got that Monday out from the last in uh, January. Oh. I'll motion. In the second? I'll. All in favor? Aye. Right. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. And our third item is just for information. It is our curriculum update for February. February is a quick month, so you can expect your March agenda to be very full and simple. Thank you. That brings us to personnel instructional. If I could have a motion to approve PI1 through PI4, please. And a second? All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. Do we have any introductions? Maybe Mr. Hager, would you like to introduce? I, no one's here. Just no one's here. <laughs> no. <sorry. laughs> okay. Would you just let maybe yeah. let the board know uh, the transition that you know we really appreciate all you've done for club rugby. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Um, hi, board. My name is Dan Hager. I am a 12-year uh, uh, veteran teacher here at Grand Island High School. Before I started teaching here at the high school, I was actually brought on as the club rugby coach as a volunteer. Um, I continued that role up until. Uh, about two months ago when I made the decision to step down as the volunteer coach 
and um, I let some of our alumni know that decision, and they reached out to me that they wanted to take over the club and continue to, to lead the club as a, volunteer, as a group of volunteers. So um, we were able to have two of those members be fingerprinted um, and go through the process of being fingerprinted and being approved uh, so that their names could be on the agenda for today. So we're working for that. Those members, uh, Jason Mendoza and Matt Terrell. Jason Mendoza is a 2016 graduate, and Matt Terrell is a Grand Island resident who has helped us with the club for about the last four to five years. Dan, thank you for all the years you've contributed to rug the rugby club. I know it's been really special uh, to have the club and to have you as a leader, and I have a feeling you're going to be attending uh, at yes, I, I, all I, the games. I think I will as well. So, and I appreciate everyone's support of the Grand Island Rugby Club and everything we've done for the last uh, 15 years. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Just a random question. We, we don't have a women's program? We do not have a women's program, that is correct. We've tried to start a women's program a few different times, but we just have not had the, um, the volunteer leaders to really take that take that rushing out. So we've, uh, Kenmore has a women's team through their town, so we've always promoted, we've had a few grand students go and play with them over the years, we've always promoted that uh, to go and play with the Kenmore team. Um, Thanks. Nice job on the WGR 550 last week. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to personnel non instructional. If I could have a motion to approve PNI 1 through PNI 3, please. I'll motion. In a second. I'll All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. That brings us to finance with Dr. Harris. Okay, so we have a couple items uh, tonight for action. The first being a piano donation to Sidway Elementary School uh, for the music department. Um, subject area B is the UPK contracts. Um, this lays out, uh, number one, that we are anticipating 185 slots for the 23-24 school year, as well as what our community-based organizations are able to support. Um, so we are asking for approval, and then as we work through the lottery process, they will be updated, and the board will be updated with information as well. The next item, which is subject C, is in reference to substitute bus drivers rate um, and increase is requested, as well as CDL uh, training payment. We are hoping this entices more people to become interested <coughs> and actually stay for the long term of subbing or realizing they love it so much they just want to be an employee full time. Um, but um, we are hoping to implement these uh, two items immediately. Um, that way we can push this out to the community uh, as well as other advertisements to see if we can retain some staff. Item uh, subject area D is the contract for the confidential employees. Um, as you'll remember, we just finished SRP a couple months ago. They are an extension um, off of that contract as well as some additional benefits. So we have met with them and we've come to an agreement. Okay, if I could have a motion to approve finance A through D, please. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. Okay, uh, subject area uh, E is the check warrants for January. F is budget transfers under 15,000. Um, G is a little bit different. Um, it's two wrapped in one, um, as I'm sure the board is still aware. Uh, we have an employee who is really serving the capacity of two jobs currently. Um, we've posted it and tried to hire one of them is a treasurer's position, the other one is the payroll position. We, we need payroll to run, or I assume that a lot of people would be meeting at these meetings for something completely different. Um, so what we did as a business department is we sat down and we developed kind of like a schedule of how we can get these things done so they're current to the board as well as um, hitting one of the items that has been brought up in a risk assessment in reference to cash flow. So you will see an attachment here that shows uh, the cash flow as projected for the entire year, the cash flow of what actually is happening as of January, and um, a couple
couple of different accounts bank reconciliation and then the schedule of how we see this going forward. So the hope is as we go forward, we're just, we really are working collectively. Um, I've done some recs, the secretary has done some recs, so we check those over. And um, once we're able to hire, whatever that looks like, um, we are hoping to be caught up to speed, but this is the schedule that we're foreseeing. Cheryl, so she can do her stuff before we do the presentation. All right, let's to special education. Are yeah. oh, we up for a motion for services? Thank you. Um, so, uh, recommendation or action, please, on um, our CPSC and CSC program um, recommendations, please. Quick, can you have a second, then? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any extensions? Motion carries 6-0. If the board is ready, we're going to work through our presentation for the budget. There, we're very pleased to report there are 122 slides in this presentation, so we may not spend a lot of time on slides that we shared with the board at the last meeting, especially if they haven't changed. So the first slide I'm going to jump to is <coughs> the budget meeting dates because that does have a change. The last time we were together, we talked about adding a tentative special budget meeting date for Tuesday, April 11th. Uh, Ruby, that is uh, there because the governor's uh, final budget is due, I think, April 1st. Um, yes, and so I had the joy of being in Albany uh, this weekend into today. Um, and one of the things that was brought to our brought to our attention is number one, April 1st is a weekend. Um, they are not sure that we will have something by March 31st. They're hoping those first couple of days thereafter. Um, so we wanted to make sure this is shown to the board and it's well uh, publicized so people know that it's something that we're anticipating. If something changes between now and our next board meeting, um, we can change this accordingly, but I, I just don't see them putting up anything final. Uh, the March 27th meeting. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right. So tonight we're going to hear from Cheryl, <coughs> we're going to hear from Mike, and we're going to hear from our instructional technology department. So Cheryl, take it away. All right. So the first slide, I just wanted to um, highlight a few areas that uh, people personnel um, covers, uh, ranging from special ed, um, and also you know, all of the KPS faculty and staff, um, oh. Okay. oh, good job, sorry. <laughs> um, health services residency, um, we have the homeless, home hospital instruction, foster care, um, homeschooling, uh, our EL ELL program, family support services. Uh, we are running again this summer at K-12 special education summer school. And I did leave COVID liaison on, on here as well because we are still <coughs> reporting our faculty and staff and our students' um, cases um, as per the Erie County Department of Health. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Just odd, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. 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 Okay, so it's skipping all the years. I know. I know that this is also on board docs, yes. and all the pages are there, so you can look, follow along in your <laughs> <laughs> I don't need one right now, but I would like to. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, I can make copies now, but they're going to send you to a, well, it's all good. This is a double-sided copy that you have. That's all right, as long as I can get one. Yes. I do keep that. Yes. Here's the last one. So over the past few years, I'd like to thank the Board of Education for all of your support, you know, and increasing our supports um, for our students. Um, currently, right now, among three to twelve, all of our buildings, we have seven speech pathologists. We have four social workers, six school psychologists, 
um, eight school counselors. Um, we have five school nurses plus two part-time float nurses. And we also have um, four ENL ESL teachers. So again, thank you very much. Um, it has helped our students tremendously. Appreciate it. So this year, I am asking for two things, um, a 1.0 um, ENL teacher, so that we have an ENL teacher for every building. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then also, most recently, um, we've been um, researching the Youth mental, aid, mental Health First Aid Program. I know that we have brought this up a few years back. It was pretty um, cost prohibitive, but we have a way that maybe we can uh, bring that cost down a little bit and get our entire district trained, which I'll talk about in the next few slides as well. Okay, so going to family support services, I'm going to touch on touch um, based on that first before I get into the uh, youth health dental first aid. Um, currently, um, the following agencies are servicing our students. Um, we have Horizon Health Services. We have two staff members. Um, one's one is um, in district on Monday. The other uh, provider is in district on Thursdays. We have Child and Family Services in district on Fridays. Gateway Longview, um, we have one staff member um, that is seeing huge students in the morning and then Kegabine in the afternoon. Um, we do have an additional day um, that actually that should be under Child and Family Services, but there's an additional day that Child and Family Services is looking to come um, and service our students at Sidway, since Sidway is the only building at this time that doesn't have a provider. We have Mobile Counseling of New York um, that is at District Office and Kegabine and also sees students throughout the community. And then we have Amy Close, who's a private practitioner. She is uh, in district office, and she actually services from 3 o'clock into the evening um, some of our students. Chair, I know you've talked at great length in the past about family support services, but just for general public now, families who use outside counseling with their children can tap into this service and not interrupt an entire portion of this child's day. Correct. They can get services right here in the district without going off my own. Correct. Yeah. It's a nice setup. Thank you. Um, I did put the approximate number of students that these practitioners are seeing. I talked to Jessica today, Hutchings, um, who spearheads this and organizes this program. Uh, they are at capacity. Every single provider we have right now is at capacity, so which is why we're looking at that additional day at Sidley and hopefully um, some additional practitioners as well. Um, we no, just to that note, um, do you want to let, I mean, you don't use services to service out, correct? Yes. I just correct. want to make sure that people understand that even though we're at capacity that our children Yes, are and, and let me clarify, we're at capacity for them seeing students in the district. Um, but there are services that can be, be provided in Niagara Falls, in Buffalo, if the families really, really need those services until a spot opens up. Um, this far, thus far this year, we have had 80 referrals um, to family support services, and approximately at least 67 students are being seen at this time, um, Monday through Friday throughout our schools. We will continue throughout the summer. And the practitioners will be here so that the students don't, don't get any of their services interrupted during the summer months. We will be open all of the buildings the same days of the week, the same times. So going to my first request um, so that we can have an ENL teacher in every building. Um, currently, uh, what we have is we have a 1.0 at Sidway. We actually have a teacher that's split between the middle school and high school. We have another teacher that is split between Hugh and Kegabine. And we have another teacher that is split between the high school and Kegabine. So due to, due to the needs of our students, um, so due to the needs of the students, um, we did projections on actual numbers this year and then projections for next year. So this is Sidway currently. Um, that, that teacher is there full time seeing students for about 280 minutes. Um, and then next year, our projection also is another 280 minutes total. However, um, we aren't um, projecting yet. We don't have the actual numbers for kindergarten. So we're hoping that keeping the 1.0 at Sidway um, will be a good fit there. ENL at Hughes Road in Kegabine. Um, currently, we have 10 students. Um, 
at Cuth, we have eight at Kedivine for a total of 420 minutes. Um, next year projections are 14 at Cuth, um, and then uh, 12, I'm sorry, and then 10 at Kedivine for an increase of 70 minutes for a total of 490 minutes. So we do have an increase um, in, in the Cuth Kedivine um, zone for next year. Cheryl, the increase to, <coughs> did you tell me that uh, when they're initially screened, they're being screened and uh, being identified as needing more services than we've seen. Yeah, I know, they'll talk about that the last okay. slide, that's correct. Um, the middle school, um, currently we have um, 14 students for 160 minutes. Um, however, next year we're looking at 12 students, but those minutes have increased, which I'll talk about on the last slide, about why there are less students, but there are more minutes that we're projecting. And in the high school, um, currently we are seeing um, nine students for a total of 200 minutes. Um, however, next year, again, we're seeing nine students, but those minutes have definitely increased another 40 minutes to another class period. So as Dr. Graham said a few minutes ago, um, just a little bit of a background. Uh, last, in 2021, we had 55 ML students. 21-22, we increased to 69 ML students. Currently this year, um, we have a little bit less. We have 56, and we are projecting if we add 10 additional kindergartners just to stay, stay safe, we're going to be at about 50 students. And as Dr. Graham pointed out before, when our students are screened, when our students take the nicest lab test, um, we have a couple of students that came from Ukraine that also have special ed needs. Um, when you look at um, those needs and you look at the uh, regulations that New York State sets for during the screening process and, getting the, and, and when they take the nice slot, we're looking at, even though we have less students, we're looking at an additional 150 minutes a day in order to make sure that the ENL students have the supports that they need, which pretty much equals that 1.0 ENL teacher. One of the other things that's a hold up is, is when you have teachers um, in between buildings, that travel time also eats into the minutes that we could be servicing our students. So which is why the request for another 1.0 female teacher would be something that we're looking to get Any questions about email? So then going on to um, the youth mental health first aid piece. So what is it? Um, it's an early intervention for public education program. It teaches the adults how to recognize signs and symptoms to suggest a potential mental health challenge. It gives reassurance to a youth who may be experiencing a mental health challenge, and it can refer a student service that they need. The endeavor here would be to train all of our staff, faculty, staff, etc., over a two-year period. This means teachers, SRP, um, including teacher aides, bus drivers, custodians, etc., etc. So uh, 10 of us had a meeting last week um, with Hamber. Um, we looked to get the program, they came and introduced the program. Um, to us answered many, many questions. And what we tried to look into was for us to invest in a train the train train the trainer program, which then means that it's, that they would come, the, the national organization would come and train 10 of us, and then the, the 10 of us in the district would be responsible for training the entire faculty staff in Grand Island schools. Thus, costing approximately $23,000 for the 10 of us to be trained and to deliver this program over the next two years. Um, we, actually, we actually have another meeting with Hamburg in April. Um, they'll be taking the 10 train the trainers um, through a three-hour training just to see um, if all of those 10 people are still interested in being a trainer. Um, from there, if everybody's still interested, then we will invest in the three-day consecutive training this June so that we are up and running for September to start training our faculty and staff. Who's the 10 people and how would you decide who would be training to train the rest? So the 10 people were our people personnel staff on one to two of. 
so that it hits every building in every department. Um, and it was just, you know, it, it was input on who also wanted to be trained. So it's our social workers, it's admin, it's teachers, it's a nurse. You know, there's a variety of people that will be being trained. No, I just think in June. We will invest in those three day trainings in June, probably the last week of June. So that when the kids are here. <coughs> and then is there some COVID funds? Yes, um, probably at the next presentation, you will see some of those um, items that are general fund requests if they are able to fit within um, any of the COVID uh, funds. The last pot of money that remains is the American Rescue. So right. if things fit in there, we'll start doing that. I, right now, we leave everything as a normal request. That's why this is shown this way, but we are talking internally to see. So we get a break down the fund. Sure. Yeah. And as always, you know, the request for the ENL teacher, the request for um, the mental health training, you know, um, is in alignment with our um, district strategic plan goals, which is what I know we try to stick to. Is there any questions? All right, uh, good evening everyone. Um, on behalf of our curriculum department, we had talked at last board meeting about getting a little update about where we are with some data. And um, it's been a couple of years since we've been able to accurately look at some um, comparable data across New York State with our common assessments, both 338 and high school on um, regents exams. So I want to start by just kind of telling you a little story about when uh, Dr. Graham began here and I began here uh, as a high school principal. We had a lot of conversations about instruction. We had a lot of goals about improving our academic performance. And philosophically, what that meant was we had a belief that no kid should graduate, or not graduate, I should say, from high school in this district without with, with being surprised, with, with being or feeling like no one wanted to do anything to help support them, without making sure that they felt like that we were there every step of the way trying to help and do everything in our power to get them to cross that finish line. And I can honestly say, now that we're in 2021-22, that we've fulfilled that mission to the best that we can. I guarantee you when I was high school principal and I called students at the end of the year, not one of those parents were surprised and they would tell us that they know we did everything we could. And I know that when uh, Mrs. Kretz Harvey, if she has to make any of those calls this year, is going to do the same because those um, elements we put in place that really help to do things in terms of improving not only our graduation rate, but also improving the amount of kids who graduate from Grand Island High School and the past regions. So I wanted to kind of show you a slide that celebrates how far we've come. Um, if you look at the darker bottom two rows, you'll see our graduation rate back in 2015 and 16 was 82 percent, um, 87%, sorry, graduation rate. And it's consistently gone up from the lower 90s to the higher 90s, now consistently for the last three years. So we're currently last 21-22 school year at a 96% graduation rate. And if you take a look at that Regents with Advanced Designation, that really went up from, um, I'll call it a dismal 42% back then, to a bunch of kids who are really rocking it now in our school at 78%. A year before that was close to 70%. Um, and I will tell you that that number at 78% was the second highest in all of Western New York to just East Aurora School District. So um, as far as the improvements that we've made as a district, I'm very proud of them. Um, some of the other data shows you kind of how we got there. We looked at a lot of different things. We looked at minimizing our number of students who are taking um, a two-year algebra class. We are reducing the number of kids who are taking non-regents math throughout the high school. And by what that basically means is we are pushing kids into the classes that are more appropriate for them. Um, Reagan is a fine example of that. As, as she stood before you and we gave her a standing ovation, one of the things that we are looking at constantly with students and saying, these kids can do it, these kids can succeed. Why are we not giving them the chance and the opportunity to? So that idea of putting kids in the right classes, encouraging every student, and I'm looking at many of you, to, to do your best and to challenge yourself because you will and you can do it, is something philosophically that we've been promoting in high school for the last several years. So just wanted to share that success story. And we're going to For, for the board, Mike, I, <laughs> it, I think the board understands this is 
tremendous growth. This is incredible growth. Going from 42% of our students graduating with an advanced regions diploma in the 15, 16 year to being second in Western New York uh, in, in the most you know, current year last year. Mike, this is a testament to you, it's a testament to the teachers, uh, the leadership staff, uh, everybody collaborating to work hard, uh, our school counselors in particular, all working with you uh, to, to make these changes. So I am very proud uh, to share this with the board. So this is great news. I'm just proud of the teamwork because it seems like it's not only something we would here to do, but it's continuing, which is something I know we're proud of. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to share a couple of slides. First of all, we're going to look at some high school regions data. Those of you who have known Dr. Graham for a while, which many of you on the board, um, we are very, we like to compare ourselves to similar schools. Um, one of those schools tends to be Amber. Um, I, I can understand and fulfill that because I had a brother who went to Amber school my whole life, so I was always comparing our schools. And so when I started here, it was like no difference. Um, we also compare ourselves to other similar schools. So I'm going to show you a series of trends um, in data. First is the English Regents exam. Just to give you an example, um, the green line is Hamburg, or, or sorry, the green line is Grand Island, and that other line is Hamburg. And what you'll see in terms of English language is um, Grand Island's been consistently high in the English Regents exam. And if you move to the next slide and look at it as compared to other similar schools. Sure. Mike, can um, you just, uh, for, yeah, it's for a, the board, just read the percent uh, proficient. I think it's 90. It's, it's like above 95 so, so it's, yeah. ex it's exceptionally good. Thank you, sir. And then if you compare it to similar schools, you'll see that even us in Hamburg do very well compared to similar schools. The schools that get added in are Alden High School as well as Amherst High School. And just so those of you who know Amherst traditionally, um, in, in the past, has scored above us just by a little bit. Alden is, you'll see that the data is kind of a little all over the place. So if we move on to the Next exam, which is algebra, you'll see that our line again, the green dark line compared to Hamburg, um, a lot more consistent over the past several years. We definitely are still in that range where we're above the 90% um, 90 mark and moving toward that 90% mark. Um, again, Hamburg gap kind of widened for a year there, and I don't know what happened over there, but as you can see, we're consistently still above Hamburg now currently on the last assessment. Given. And you'll see a similar trend um, if you sorry, if I may zoom in to see those numbers, it kicks me off. Um, but if you zoom in and look at the similar schools, you'll see a similar trend where Grand Island outperforms all of the similar schools on the um, algebra regions exam in math, which is good news because math has been an area in which we've been really working to grow in in the past um, 10 years. So moving on, you will see, I think, the geometry assessment next. Um, definitely a little bit of a gap there. This is not new to us. We've seen this trend throughout time. What I will say over time is as, as we've moved into that advanced regions, we've taken more and more kids into geometry than we have in the past, so more of our students are taking geometry. But we're still struggling a little bit with the data um, compared to Hamburg. But if you move to the next slide and compare it to similar schools, we're still doing very well above um, Amherst and Alden. Um, so that's good news for us as well. Um, our next assessment, we're going to look a little bit at the um, elementary three through um, five assessments. Um, this is an interesting comparison between Kagabine and Huth. Um, for years, you've probably heard the story that Huth outperforms, outperformed Kagabine in many of our areas. And if you're looking at this particular line, you're going to see a red line and a green line. Um, the green line represents Huth Elementary, and the red line represents um, Kagabine Elementary, so in the math assessment at grade three, you'll still see the trend there, but the trends are very similar at both buildings, and you'll see that there, um, there were some changes back in about 2014, 15, 16, where we brought in some new assessments, and the standards and grading scales changed in many of those exams. That was associated with the opt-out movement, less kids were taking the assessments, and you see us, as, as you do on the data, kind of crawling up a little bit, but when you move on to fourth, grade and fifth grade, you will notice that Kagebine actually has been outperforming youth in the last couple of years in math, um, which is really significant news to us. One of the things I want to say about all three of our elementary principals, I've never before seen a team of people who work better together. They're constantly collaborating on the phone, 
and um, working together to try to keep the, the, what's going on at Kegabyte is going on at you to make sure that there's alignment between our elementary models. Um, green, three math. So you'll, again, see the blue and the green line. Um, the green line is us, the blue line is Hamburg. And as you see in the last assessment, that green line is above the blue line, so we have definitely narrowed that gap with Hamburg and actually surpassed them a little bit in the math at the third grade level. Um, same thing with similar schools, even though we passed Hamburg, we're a little behind still on um, other districts, Amherst and all of them. Here we go. So grade four math. Um, Really, really good news. That line on the top, if you can't tell the colors from where you're sitting, is Grand Island. We have far surpassed Hamburg in the fourth grade math assessments. And if you move on to similar schools, you'll see a similar improvement. I think Amherst is the line above us, but we are definitely up there with our similar schools and definitely representing well um, across Western New York. And you'll see a similar pattern with the math in the fifth grade level. Well, you'll see our green lines are passing other districts, and obviously that downward trend in Hamburg and us maintaining where we are. And again, in our final um, comparison to similar schools, you're going to see Grand Island above all of the similar schools that had a decline this past year, whereas we did not decline anywhere near as much as our similar schools. And some of that decline is probably associated by the pandemic. Um, same trends for ELA. You're going to see a very similar trend where the um, youth data. I believe surpass, I see data is green, surpasses the Kagabite um, data in ELA, not much similar than we were at third grade in math. Um, if you look at fourth grade, you're going to see that again, in that particular grade, Kagabite did surpass um, ELA in the fourth grade team. And then if you look at fifth grade, you're gonna see a very narrow margin between the two with youth is on top. I will say overall, the overall data does show youth a little bit stronger in 3 through 8 as a whole, 3 through 5, sorry, as a whole. But um, I think the good news is showing that narrowing of that gap that we have seen for so many years with that inconsistency from one building to the other. And again, as I said before, our principals working together to be more aligned, I think, is a big testament to that. Um, and the fifth grade, again, comparing the ELA um, for Hamburg versus Grand Island, I think that you can see the green line, um, which is the one coming up at the end, that, that we are above Hamburg in this last assessment period for third, third grade assessments. And then similar schools were lagging a little bit in third grade, but you gotta check out this fourth and fifth grade teams consistently um, because they're really doing well, and I think that's a testament to our fourth and fifth grade teachers. Um, and you see that above similar schools were doing really, really well again. And I think Amherst is the line above us. And then for the fifth grade, compared to similar schools, again, right up there, we're consistent with everybody else um, in our similar school bracket. I think that, again, only Amherst was hard um, above us. So last segment I just want to talk about is, many of you have been aware that we've implemented an iReady diagnostic system that allows us to track our students three times throughout the year to see growth. It also is now beginning to allow us to track um, over years the vertical changes that we're seeing as cohorts go up through the years to see the trends within a particular grade level. So these are the color-coded schemes that iReady uses. It uses a green, yellow, and red labeling system from the diagnostics in which the students in green are considered to be early or on track with their grade level. Um, the darker green are possibly above grade level or close to being above grade level. The yellow students are maybe a year below grade level, and then those red students are um, two to three grade levels behind in either math or ELA. Um, what we are looking at always is a game of catch up because at the beginning of the year we show a lot of yellow and a lot of red and, and a little bit of green, and as the year goes on, you're supposed to see more green and more um, darker greens and less yellow and less red. So we're going to show you some mid-year data just to give you an example from each grade and how our students progress. The hope is in the third assessment in the spring that we're going to be able to see a lot of green, very little yellow and red um, and improvements in all areas. Um, the iReady team helps us with presenting this data. Our principals look at this data three times per year. We all look at it together. We share it with our teachers. We have the ability to drill down closer into individual teachers' information. But what you will see, especially kindergarten, you can see how 
the percentage of students, we went from very few selected students that were considered at kindergarten level to at least half of our students being at kindergarten level um, mid-year. And you also see similar trends first, second, third, a lot of growth in fourth grade um, in the mid-year and a lot of students growing out in fifth grade in the middle of the year. And the hope is that that will continue. Uh, Brian goes on to your slide to see a similar trend in the middle school. <laughs> yes, good timing. So, six, seven, eight, you will begin to see the growth um, from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year. Make sure everyone gets a copy. So, again, this data is for mathematics. I may have neglected to say that. I'll show you the ELA data quickly as well in a moment. But I think the highlight, if you move on uh, to the next slide, I think the highlight that I want you to see is we're also comparing ourselves to the national averages of um, students in New York, um, as well as the national average for students on these assessments. Um, we are above the national average almost at every grade in math, but we are not high above the national average. I think that that's one of the patterns you're going to see on this slide, K12. Um, the standardized, the, the two left columns are the national columns, the third column is the New York column, and the one with some boxes around it, that's our grand island district data. So we are above the national norms in kindergarten, a little bit in grade one and two. If we move on, three, four, five, you're going to see pretty much the same trend. Although I would say that fifth grade is doing particularly well, um, and fourth grade is also doing particularly well. Third grade, too. Um, yeah, and we can move on six, seven, eight. You're going to see actually in the middle school, we're actually farther above um, the average in mathematics. And if you go on, the next slide will give you an indication of kind of how we're doing. So um, the, the goal of the game is to get into that top rate quadrant. Quad top right quadrant is performance and growth. So it means that you're a high performing school and a growing school. I mean, your students are making more progress than other schools. Um, you'll look and you'll see our middle school is up there, a little bit kegabine. Um, so we're not growing to the degree we want to in math, and we're not necessarily as high performing in some of our schools as we want to in math. But I do think the 3 through 8 data that you've seen before on the Common Core Assessments is showing us some good promise anyway. Um, you're going to see a little bit of a flip to this when we look at ELA, and this shows you per grade level where each of our grade levels stand. So some of our strongest growing grades are 6th and 7th, um, grade 2 is up there, and you'll see some of the other grades in math are not quite as high, but when you later will look at the ELA, you'll see, as I said, a little bit of a reverse pattern. Um, so when we look at the ELA data, you're going to notice some of the same, same things, very similar um, chart scheme. We can move up to look at the grade data, and you're going to see a lot of the growth in ELA is, is bigger. Especially kindergarten, you're going to see it in grade 3, you're even going to see it in the other grades. Um, and when you look to the middle school, you don't see it quite as much, but you definitely see the growth. And so when we're talking about that, it's quite interesting that, that the flop of where our math our ELA students, our, our, middle school, sorry, our middle school students are growing most in math, but then when you look at ELA, we're looking at the ELA and not seeing quite the same growth. So when you move forward and compare it to national norms, I will say in ELA, we are higher above the national average and the national norms, as well as the state norms. In all grade levels, you know, K1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and now 6, 7, 8, we don't see it quite as much. So. What I'm kind of trying to point out is we're learning a lot of information from this data. It's quite interesting because this is the first good data we've had in a long time. We probably wouldn't have it without the um, iReady Diagnostic Program. And if you even look at the next slides, you'll see what I was talking about, where almost all of our elementary schools are in that high growth for ELA and um, high performance, which is a testament to the literacy program that we have implemented there as well as, you know, Veronica kind of middle school, even though it was so high in math, it's not necessarily performing poorly in ELA, but it's just not seeing quite the growth. So, 
I don't mean to call out particular, you know, grade level teachers or growth. Again, so soon we'll be able to see the trends of a particular grade. But if you look up here, most of our ELA students are in that top, that top quadrant, which is a good sign. Um, so that was a lot. I went through, I think, 44 slides in about 20, maybe 20 minutes or less. So I'll, I'll keep it at that. But if you do have questions, I'm here and we're willing to answer any now or at any point. Like just one question: How yeah. many have we been using already? This is the this is the second full year. So, but we implemented it um, at the end of the pandemic, right when we were coming back. But it wasn't it wasn't given three times that year because of the pandemic. Like how, how, uh, how are the information points for the national schools provided? and the New York State schools provided. Are those only schools that are participating in the program? Correct. They are only which, schools participating. Which skews, which is the, skewed. Skew, skews the right. statistical analysis. <laughs> yeah, which is why I present both. Yeah, it's, it's, like, I get that. yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's hard to choose one data source. Right, just right. well, because it's basically saying that people who are also in this program are here, right? And those who are not, which could be a large portion of schools, right. okay, you don't know where they fit. Right. All right. In terms of that, so okay. Yeah, and we do use the curriculum associated with the I Ready Diagnostic yeah. now. So that was that that was implemented for math this right. year, just for math. Right. Yeah. Is that point? Is that here in the New York State Assessments too? And now for like the lower grades, is that, is that similar to what students will see when they take a lower grade grade math? So not exactly. Um, it does have similar, some similar questions, but the iReady Diagnostic is much like the old um, STAR assessments in that it's, it, every kid's assessment is different. So it, it will ask you a series of questions what? at multiple grade levels. Depending on how you answer one question, we'll depend on which question pops up next. So if you are answering a grade level question above grade level, for example, and you get it right, it'll probably challenge you by asking you know, a fifth grade question, or maybe even a sixth grade question until you get it wrong, and then it'll bounce you back down. So it's a it's it's an assessment based on how the students ask one question to kind of gauge what level of questions they're most comfortable asking and answering. So every kid's assessment will look different. So in terms of does that relate well to the Common Core assessments, I don't know that it has a, we don't really have enough data to kind of mirror that or compare that to that side yet. I think we will have to read at this third. The questions and the content though are are aligned to the New York State standards. They are aligned to New York standards. Right. Yeah. At the grade yeah. level. Yeah. yeah. So we're going if there are no more questions for Mike, we're gonna move to Robin and Josh. Welcome. Um, I don't know if everybody knows Josh. Josh is our systems engineer, sysadmin, does all the high level computer stuff in the IT world. Um, thank you for giving us this time. We are looking to add a position in our department, and this is going to explain to you why we're asking for it. <clears throat> it came mainly as a result of a recent audit by the State Controller's Office that stated that some of our system security features needed attention, and this position will hopefully address that. So a full-time a full-time cybersecurity and data protection officer who reports to the superintendent <clears throat> would maintain the district vision and program by ensuring information assets and technologies are protected. This person would primarily be the point of contact for physical data and security and privacy. The person would hold the title of data protection officer. Data protection officer is a title that the New York State Education Department created when they created um, Ed Law 2D, and it's something that every district is supposed to have, and we, we do right now, and I hold that title, along with the other titles. So this position, should you approve it, would develop and implement a cybersecurity policy and procedures. It would also conduct regular risk assessments. It would train staff and students, monitor and respond to security incidents, collaborate with law enforcement and other organizations, and address cybersecurity threats. Um, the three categories up here are the roles that this position would primarily <coughs> hold and the, the different categories that they would fall into. So the rationale. 
Today, the schools and colleges are increasingly relying on technology to provide students with the education they need. Technology is used for everything from lesson plans to student assessments, and it's imperative that the systems are secure. Educational institutions are targets for cyber criminals through ransomware and other means. As more technology is used in schools, they become more vulnerable to cyber attacks and other digital threats. This can include everything from theft of personal information to just disruption of, and I shouldn't say just, to disruption of educational activities. Hackers and cyber criminals are becoming more sophisticated and are targeting schools to exploit our vulnerabilities in our systems. So the attacks on K-12 are becoming more and more frequent. Some local districts have been on the receiving end of these attacks and were locked out of their entire network until the demands of the ransom were met. Cybersecurity includes data security. It requires a dedicated person who can keep abreast of the frequent changing landscape. This person would build a plan in case someone did get into our systems and try and block us out. Um, as I said earlier, in 2014, the New York State Education Law 2D went into effect and it provided clear protections for student data and required all districts to designate a DPO, a data protection officer, and this position would fulfill that role. The main point of having a person in this position is to provide peace of mind to teachers, students, parents, and the Board of Ed, knowing that the sensitive data that we hold is being protected. So we'll look more closely at some of the risks and challenges. Over the past 10 years, district technology has diversified to include web-hosted as well as on-prem systems that impact everyday life in the district. A disruption or an attack in any of these systems is going to result in monetary losses as well as loss of learning. And these are some of the primary things that people are using to attack districts right now. From 2018 to the present, schools in most states have reported cyber incidents on their systems. Reported incidents from 2018 to 2021 have risen from 400 to an accumulated total of over 1,300. Since there is no formal reporting tool to report K-12 cyber incidents, many of them go unnoticed. And that's actually a problem in and of itself. The average cost of a ransomware attack on a school district in 2022 was $4.5 million. Over 2 million students have been affected by ransomware attacks on schools and districts since 2018. And the loss of learning following a cyber attack ranged from three days to three weeks. Full recovery time can take up to nine months. According to the U.S. Department of Education, K-12 institutions serve more than 50 million students in the United States. And although the total number of K-12 security incidents is impossible to reliably quantify due to the lack of consolidated data, research from the federal and private sector shows that cyber threats are continuing to escalate. So, go one back. There's a link on this slide. <clears throat> you guys get this electronically, right? Yes. So there's a good link on this slide um, from the, the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, that takes you to a podcast that Brian just clicked on right now, yes. Um, see if you can take some time. It's, it's a short one, is it eight minutes or something? An eight minute podcast. And it talks a lot about what I'm saying here, um, the importance of having someone in, in your organization, in your district, um, that focuses just on cybersecurity and the security of, of data as well as, as the physical plant as well. Um, a few statistics, a few um, incidences. December 21, a vendor in Chicago Public Schools was a victim of a ransomware attack in which more than 500 students and staff members' personal information was disclosed. So some of the data that they got were students' names, the school they were in, the dates of birth, gender, school identification numbers, and the student identification, the state student identification numbers. February 21, 2021, Massachusetts school was the victim of a denial of service attack. That's where they, they keep hitting your, your, your internet so that everything has to shut down. Um, that was up to seven days of of students not being able to access their systems. 
um, similar thing in Dade County, and another one in Connecticut. So they're attacking school districts. They're also attacking small towns. They're attacking anybody who holds data and doesn't have the resources to protect that data, basically is what they're doing. Um, so what should we be monitoring and protecting? This slide. PDF. Um, persons ident personally identifiable information is among the most important data to protect. Not following a cyber security program could exploit our finances via hacked user accounts and stolen identities. And these attacks could come from the outside, but more, more lately, they're coming from the inside as well. Having someone to build a program that educates the users and implements policies that will keep these exploits in check is key. District technology has diversified. It includes web hosted as well as on-prem systems. Systems range from financial and student information to HVAC and building security. The last time we had a capital project, I had the men with hard hats come into the office and ask for IP addresses for the lights. So I feel like we pretty much cover it all. Our, our network is controlling lots in the district. A disruption or attack in any of these systems results in monetary losses and a loss in learning. So our solution is a cybersecurity program, which is more than just an IT product. A program includes penetration test testing as well as firewall endpoint and vulnerability management. It involves working with people in the organization to create a culture of risk management. Risk management is something that they constantly talk about when we're talking about cybersecurity. It requires developing processes and using technology to protect data. So this last graphic just shows the various areas that this position would oversee in cybersecurity um, to create a unified culture and a security invested staff. Right. I know it's late, so. Right. Is it true that one of our high school principals had an email that was sent out? Uh, yes, how timely, kind of, right? It was like faking that it came from yes. our principal or an outside of the faculty. Yeah. It happens a lot. Right? It does. It does. Um, and, and I think a, a big part of this is just education. And it, it takes time and it takes someone to focus on just this to make sure that everybody is aware. Students as well. Because we're teaching them how to how to be safe and secure when they leave school and they're not in our little bubble of a, of a Google environment where they can't get email from anybody else. So is this a person or, or a program? It's, it's, or a, a, it's a person. It's a position that basically spearheads all of that, all of that that I just talked about. And then would, would there be additional costs in our program to protect everything? Or is no, no, that, and that's just it. It isn't a program. Okay. There isn't like the, a one, one safety security kind of program. It, it involves monitoring a lot of different systems um, and making sure that all of those different systems are all kept up to date with security protocols and patches and things like that. And so it's, it's that plus then it's training people, talking to people, training people, and then it's also doing penetration testing, which is attacks from the outside <coughs> that we initiate. Um, for example, one of the easy ones is phishing. You can, you can send out fake phishing emails that, you know, you know what a phishing email looks like. Well, you, we can send them out to our staff, and then anybody on the staff who replies to them we can slap their hand, or we can whatever. Yeah, You're supposed to trick. Yes, I got we, in we don't. Did you see? So you yeah. know, yeah. But but you, you know, you don't put their face on the news or anything like that. Yeah. You usually, you know, send them to training so that they learn more about phishing and why not to click on that link. And things like that. Just monitor. It's it's super yes. important because not only did this impact our secondary principal, but it impacted two of our elementary principals where parents apparently received an email that seemed to be masked uh, or. Know, coming from two of our elementary principals today, right. and we're just learning about it, right? You know, in the last few hours. Yeah. So this is a constant battle: is mm -hmm. fending off these cyber attacks on schools, and to have a dedicated person that can keep us safe from that, while also not only looking at uh, cybersecurity but the physical plant security 
as Robin indicated, even our lights are connected to IP addresses, which you know it encompasses an entire district uh, that's digitally connected. So uh, the Office of State Comptroller Ruby uh, gave us a pretty significant report. Mm -hmm. We provided them with an action plan. Correct. Uh, but they also provided us with uh, very detailed information on what we could be doing better as a yes. district. Mm -hmm. And just so people are aware, districts have cyber security, right? Like you're paying for some probably a little bit more basic level of security. A lot of districts have also invested in cyber insurance. But there is a lot of background caveats to that. So you can purchase insurance, like we purchase insurance for anything else, but if you're not making sure all of these other things are in place, when you go to put in a claim because something occurred, you run the risk that your insurance company is going to say, you didn't do this, this, and this. Um, having a person there for not only just security, but for infrastructure, for building, assists us in one, implementing the things that the Office of State Comptroller has mentioned, truly making sure somebody has eyes on it instantly over something occurring and we're trying to backpedal. Um, and when I see $4 million from school, I, I can't imagine someone being held to ransom for $4 million. I, you find districts that only want to pay a couple hundred thousand, um, and it, it is detrimental. I, I've been in a district where we were shut down for a little bit in reference well, to Well, you see that's true. Yeah. 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 I know public schools, sure. too. Yeah. yeah. And there are local public schools in okay. Erie, one of that yeah. have been yes. attacked. And they found that hiring someone like this to have been successful yes. Yes. in keeping those. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We don't hear about a lot of them, though, because people don't want to talk about them. And and especially, like, even some of the stuff that we're talking about here, you, you don't want to broadcast that, you know, we're worried about your security because that's just not something that you And to your credit, Robin and Josh, you've been great at educating all of our faculty and staff about some of these attacks. I know that emails have gone out looking like they've come from me asking right. for tax information or financial information, but our, our faculty and staff are becoming more attuned to those types good. of attacks, yes. but they don't stop. And they're happening all the time. Mm -hmm. So this this type of position would provide us with another layer of security for sure. Thank you. Better than uh, any other questions, email me. That's fine. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. It's almost nine p.m. If uh, we have some students who would like to exit, uh, to you know, particularly for driving purposes, this might be a good time to take a break and sign some forms for our students. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Ryan and Josh. Is Josh support? Oh, here you are. <laughs> I think uh, there may be another question. When Sue comes back, we'll get some. Bye, Ray. I just I had a couple questions. Um, I know the um, you had mentioned that there was a, a regulation from the state, what's it called, DP one or um, and law two D. And then, oh, the position is the DPO. Um, what is DPO? Uh, yeah, data Protection Officer. Oh, okay, right. But the, so you had mentioned that the Cybersecurity Data Protection Officer was, is that a suggestion by the state or a mandate? A state mandate. The DPO is, a, is, is written into the Ed Law 2. set us up to be able to look ahead and prepare or to create policy. Um, I think that's probably the, the, the best way of, of saying it. Well, would you say that the threat now is much more <coughs> Thank you. Yes, right? that, that, so is, that is part of it as well. It's not that we're not doing a good job, it's just with the way everything's evolving and how even now, our um, security cameras are um, on, on computers that we really need somebody right. full time to focus because we lost the 
and every every year and we add more and more security <coughs> cameras. Every year we add more and more. So it, it's really more of a um, feeling. The the principals spend time looking at the security cameras too, where they should be spending time out in the classrooms being instructional leaders. But they're spending some of their time doing some of the security work that could then be shifted over to someone else and give them more time to do what, what they do best, and what so they've the, been trained to do. So the threat and the need has just outgrown what the system we have in place. Yes. yes. As far as our action plan and implementation, would you say this person is critical, or how would you describe this person's role in the implementation of that action plan? You mean the, the action plan from, from the, the audit? audit? Yes. Um, I would say that this person is, is critical in doing it well. I would agree. Would, would we get through it if we had to? We always do. But in doing it well, yes. And uh, another thing that um, Robin expressed earlier is that this person is under the superintendent. It's, it's listed that way strategically um, because the thought is if it is someone who is considered a peer, then you other administrators get input, right? Like, I'll be very honest. I don't like changing my password every 30 days. It's not my thing, right? So, so if I get input, I'm gonna be like, no, I don't wanna change my password. Um, there was actually a presentation, um, I think it was BOCES has done a presentation about how quickly people are hacking passwords. So the passwords that were 10 characters, they do you know good now. Give them, give them a couple hours, you're done. Um, and they're now recommending passwords up to 16 and 25 characters long. Like, you have all of those little pieces that may seem like not so important or what could really happen, but those are the attack areas. And then what are those passwords really protecting and, and what access are people then being granted in your system? So um, there were things like that written up um, in the audit as well as who has rights to grant permissions and take permissions away, right? When you're a smaller district, you have a lot of overlap, which has occurred, um, and some of those things were hand slaps from them as well. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so what goes into finding the right candidate for this role? I know that you mentioned earlier the fact that advertising that role might not be something. No, no, not, well, not the role, because cybersecurity is actually a, a pretty hot field right now. Um, kids, kids go to school for cybersecurity. The so, so the right the position there. So the DPO, you can go online for the data protection officer piece, and there are um, what is it called? The list of things that a person does in their job, well, <laughs> their job duties, their classifications, right? Um, and then there's also something a CISO. Help me with CISO. Chief. Information Security Officer. Chief Information Security Officer is is what this type of role would be called in the real world, not the school world. And there are there are many many job descriptions and, and qualifications and tasks that, that a, a CISO would perform. So as far as like like listing listing it to the public to say this is what we're looking for, that would that wouldn't be difficult. Okay. People. There's input. There would be input from from you as well, Ruby. Um, but right, it, the, the the hierarchy of, of command um, is mainly because of what Ruby said. The the person, the that position is going to be telling me that certain things need to change. Telling Ruby that certain things need to change. So it can't be like at, at the same, you know. Yeah, and that's like a that kind of answers my questions as to the checks and balances of how this position is helping 
or not? Like, if we can see throughout time what the difference is or, like, what has been added um, that is making everything better. Yeah, so I think some of that would probably be sh shared in more of an executive uh, session yeah. mm -hmm. over a board meeting, um, just because of the area you're discussing. Right. But there would definitely be right. um, checks and balances and then information shared. Uh, like if this person found that there was a hole somewhere, they would patch it and report. Right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. one, one other thing, Josh, I'm going to ask you to come up to the podium just for, for a few minutes. Uh, besides, besides this role uh, looking at cybersecurity, could you talk a little bit about how our systems integrate, for example, the one button lockdown? system that's in our elementary schools. We really want that here. I see that the, if, if the board grants this position, one of the job responsibilities would be to make sure that that is also taken care of at the middle school and high school level. Can you just give the board just you know, like a two minute elevator pitch on what one button lockdown does and how integrated it is? So the school is built up of multiple securities, one being access control. Um, and a few other things, time clocks and, and so on. Um, uh, burglary system, things like that. Um, in our access control, we have a module that allows you to change the threat level depending on any kind of intrusion into the school. One button lockdown makes, the way that we've done it um, in the elementaries recently, connects all those systems together. Um, there are other systems out there that do an overall connection with all this stuff, but we would be adding on to that. We already have the systems here, um, making the connections in between those systems and telling them what to do and how to alert and who to alert. Uh, having a person to, that knows those things is, could actually save a lot of money um, for the district and making those connections. That one button lockdown will give you, it obviously locks down the building, um, sends an alert to key people, and puts the threat level um, to where it needs to be, calls 911 for whichever the reason, and um, makes it a lot faster, really. The, the old system would have required an adult to go on a PA system. Yep and put themselves in harm's way, in essence. This system allows somebody in the building to click a button mm -hmm. and get to safety. Correct. And that, that means everybody, every student, every staff member is safer. Uh, these are the systems, besides all of the important things that are often shared tonight, this is the next level, this is the next step, because we do not have that system here. Uh, but it's in, in the works, I guess, but it's just not here. Right, yet. and this is a one-time action, not Okay, I've called this person, now I need to call the next place, and then call the next place. Right. So it's a, it's, it's a complex set of systems that you need a specialist like an engineer like yourself to work with the, the district facilities director and others to put something together that is uh, keeping everybody safe. So this is just one other level that is really well above Robin's responsibilities, right? We, we need to be able to, to take a few things off of Robin's plate give it to a specialist and allow Robin to be that director of instructional technology to oversee the chief information officer data that goes up to level zero and goes up to the state and comes back to us and helps us uh, do all those important things. But to add on all of these other uh, cybersecurity and physical plant security elements to Robin's role is, is just too much, and particularly as Sue stated earlier threats increasing, uh, we see them increasing on a regular basis. So. They're being a lot more sophisticated, they really are, and it's taking up more and more time to, to catch these things ahead of time. Thank you, Josh. Sure. Anything else on this particular topic? All right, so that brings us to the budget presentation. Uh, I think it's important for the board to know that uh, if there are slides in here from the previous budget presentation that haven't been edited or changed, then we're just going to move forward and not talk about them. So, uh, Ruby, is there anything new on this slide? Uh, no? Okay, good. 
So the board has seen this slide in the past. Anything change? No. Okay, and we're waiting again for the governor to give us the final. Yes, the only thing um, I will state through a discussion in Albany um, that was brought up was the uh, Foundation Aid high impact tutoring set aside and some pushback that may be coming from uh, the Senate or the Assembly about this set aside and really just allowing districts the freedom mm -hmm. to utilize the funds how they seem uh, they deem fit for their district. So uh, this may change um, coming forward, but I just want to mention that. Thank you. I, I think that NYSA and superintendents would support that, that flexibility. Anything new on the summary of all revenues? No. Not since the last time, that is. Anything changed here? We just uh, put this slide together to incorporate um, really the thing that changes from the first presentation and now is usually retirements. So um, what is listed here is there are five retirements that are being assumed. We will go through that a little bit further in the budget, but this allows you to see some of the uh, higher dollar amount areas and what those increases are. This different. just kind of copies what, Same. Yeah, what we said last night. All right. So as we move into the budget overview, just saying yeah, no changes just, here. All right. Fair. Yes. So, so the reason for any expenditure change, which you would see in the area of salary, you would see it in the area of benefit and retirement. And that is just based upon... Um, really two things. Number one, you have people that have put in to retire, and you also have people that are finishing up their last payment into a 403B in this school year. So they fall off the list as people come on the list, and I hope is that more people fall off than join the list, so we have some savings there, but um, those things are captured. And then you'll see the budget gap um, has <coughs> Close a little bit. Go to the next yep. one. Oh, okay. And I'll just scroll down a little bit here. Yes. So the budget compensation change. Yes, that's salary compensation change. When it's put together, it is your salary area. So it is the salary and the sub salary. The two of those make up compensation. Oh. Did this uh, budget gap number change or not? No, it did. It did? Not enough. <laughs> We're still working. Yes. Um, so you will see uh, we have a gap of $460,000. And this means if we roll over this year's budget to next year, the, the, we still need to trim. Yes. This is um, a new ad slide. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the slide. I just try to throw the little pieces so. Um, we don't have to make multiple slides. Um, the first thing you'll see here is substitute rates of pay recommendations. Um, we are presenting this to the board because there are a lot of rate of pays that should be addressed. Um, I'm not asking for action. This is just moving forward with the board approving uh, the final budget and then it going on to voters. You would see this then probably in a June meeting to be approved to start for the uh, July school year. So you'll see uh, the current <laughs> rates. Um, we do it daily and hourly for the instructional side. So you'll see teachers uncertified, teachers certified, building-based subs, and retired subs. And Dr. Graham, do you want to talk a little bit about the sub rates and what's kind of going on? Sure, yeah, we just know that it's competitive and we want to make sure that we are uh, as competitive as others to, to draw in substitutes uh, and uh, pay them appropriately and make sure that we can cover the needs of in the district. So you'll see some proposals here, as Ruby said, these won't be finalized until June, but we wanted to give you an update just so you can see some of the changes. Uh, for example, teachers who are uncertified right now make $100 a day. That, that factors into about $14.29 an hour. The proposal would be to bump that up by $15 a day so that it's well above minimum wage. Right, and just so uh, the board is aware, minimum wage, might correct me if I'm wrong, is $14.20. 
So when you go into the non, well, number one, so that also means for a uncertified teacher that you're trying to attract and you're almost paying that person um, minimum wage. So we, we are trying to look more attractive across the board. Um, and then in the non-instructional sub side, you will see that there are people that are at minimum wage because once minimum wage occurs, you have to pay them at least minimum wage. But we're taking into consideration a couple of different things. Um, one, across all job areas, it's extremely hard to get subs. Secondly, we I, I'm making an assumption that by December of 2023, we're going to see starting January 1 of 2024, that minimum wage is $15 in uh, New York State. So this allows us to either be on par and prepared for that or above it and attracting people in um, for these different uh, openings as we need um, substitutes. Anything else on this slide that you want to highlight? Um, this really just is showing some of the requests that you're seeing in the two earlier slides that go um, either building building by building or department by department. This breaks it out a little bit. Um, I, I, I lump everything the first go around, but I do like people to see these are the areas that uh, conference and travel are being requested to increase in. And this is really due to a lot of this is pushed into American Rescue and us bringing it back slowly into the um, general fund we brought. A lot of the stuff you see in the 22-23 year, we brought back last, well, this year, technically, um, and then we are just transitioning it fully into the uh, upcoming budget. And then health insurance, it just lets you know the different items that are included there, so you can see year to year. And textbook, we are putting the funds back into the buildings, but we have not increased the overall textbook um, budget. So I just want to break those out because they were lumped into larger numbers. Any questions? How are we doing on health insurance? <laughs> Sundays I guess. Sundays are interesting. Um, right now we are performing on par. We're not over expensed. I do, I do not think that we will see um, the savings that we saw during COVID because there was so much restriction with people receiving services. So you you will act, are actually seeing an uptick because a lot of things that people put off, they're now able to uh, get scheduled with their doctors. Um, we have implemented some uh, changes. We've had discussions. Uh, I know some additional rates are coming back on rebates. So we're doing everything we can to uh, maximize savings. Is there a at some point in time to the understanding of how self-insurance is working oh, out yeah. as, as compared to other options? I know that it's yeah. a broad question. But. Yeah. Uh, yes is the broad answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll work on that. Do you need that plan during budget? No, I mean, I, you know, what, if whenever you can do it. I mean, it is what it is at this point in time. We're not going to change our health right. insurance during budget season, but certainly it'd be nice to know that Oh, I ask the same questions yeah, at our, and, our and meetings. I, I've never talked about health insurance before, so it's not. Oh, my good. I'm doing Just because you're so I only ask a question. If you're ready, maybe not. Just wanted to know what this is. Okay. So for enrollment slides, you've seen these at the last budget presentation, so I'm going to skip ahead. All of these slides have been changed. Remember, we've shown you the current class size ratios. We talked about that in the last meeting. And we also talked about uh, our predicted kindergarten enrollment number. Uh, remember that it uh, looks at births attributed to Grand Island, and it goes back five years and makes a prediction. These are our projected elementary class size ratios. Nothing has changed since the last presentation. This is current secondary enrollment, projected secondary enrollment. And then the next presentation that we do, uh, we'll make a final decision on the number of sixth grade teachers. Uh, it's important for the board to know that in the next school year, not starting in September, but the September and the 2024 school year, uh, we're only looking at 100 and 
1976, students coming out of that fifth grade class into sixth grade in the 2024 school year. So final decisions will be made in, in the upcoming uh, presentation. And then of course, uh, nothing really has changed here. We did actually, one thing may have changed, or well, this is a new slide you just put it's in. It's a new one. Right, we did have one person get dropped. Yes. Their intent to retire. And, and we're replacing all of those. Yeah, these positions will be replaced. Yes. <laughs> well, I didn't say that at something, and people were like, what's going on? So I wanted to make sure it was set here. And I know Ruby likes to show the board some of the new things that were added uh, with the board approval uh, going into this school year. So these are the things that we added last year. <laughs> And moving forward, as we scrub uh, the request, as the board knows, uh, we start moving uh, requests into the 2024 and beyond column. So you'll see that we're still investigating uh, the uh, need, if there is a need, to increase art. I know Hillary met with Mike today to look at course selections and course requests for students. So Hillary and I have a meeting, I think, tomorrow to review some of that data. Actually, I was wondering if you could let us know the number of students taking classes this year compared to the projections for next year. When you get those numbers, or just our yeah. Oh sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Mike, would you think of more of that to so be able to report that out at the next meeting? Sure. Uh, so. We're also taking a look to see, this is a very minor increase. Uh, right now we have a 0.5 English teacher uh, who's certified as English and a 0.5 teaching assistant. They're all one person. Uh, and so Dr. Sarah, I'm just going to pause you. Oh. You are missing the page. Yes, so um, we caught this this morning. We corrected. This is the one you emailed me about this morning. The adding that agent. So in your printed copy that is not there, we will print that. But it is the um, the first page. So that includes the high school, middle school, the rest are in there. It does not change the overall total number you see at the end, but I do know that one page is missing. When you were saying that, I was like, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> At least it's just one. But I didn't know what you were talking about. You were looking. It's in Word Yeah. It's in Word Yeah. But it didn't get printed. All right. So what else stayed? Um, the as you know, the web coordinators do quite a bit of work for the middle schools right now. That's still under review. Everything else has shifted to the 2024 and beyond. With respect to youth and uh, other elements of the district, these items here have been moved to uh, further review in years to come. And we're still looking at the ENL need for the district, uh, increasing from 0.5 to 0.6 for community relations, increasing school resource officer from a 1 FTE to a 2 FTE. The athletic trainer has been moved to 2024 and beyond. The Chief Data Protection, Security, and Compliance Officer, which was part of our presentation tonight, is still here as a request for the board. Uh, community Ed Coordinator position has been moved to the end. Flag football for girls is still under consideration. And the office support staff has been moved uh, to the 2024 season to review. And then operations. Uh, so uh, under operations, we did keep uh, we did keep um, restorative practices that's still under review, um, as well as the freshman transition um, program that was um, requested by the high school. So we are looking um, into both of those to see uh, what our options are. Um, the other items that were kept within the uh, under review area pertain to some of the areas of multi-year plans. We will get into that. That is a, a slide. 
kind of moving. Okay. I just couldn't see the bottom. Oh, okay. Um, so you will see the tech department equipment replacement plan is still under review. Um, the high school trails is under review. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Okay. Um, and as well as the five-year uh, plan for the fitness center, we are also looking. We are also looking into the high school elevator uh, and the needs for that and the safety concerns, those type of things. So I still have it here is under review, and um, the Chromebook replacement uh, is also under review. We have quite a book quite a few Chromebooks that will be cycling off, um, so it is something that we are still looking into with IT. And then, um, you want to talk about vape detectors? We did add vape detectors, that is a new addition. Uh, this would <clears throat> ask the board for approval. Uh, we had a big uh, meeting uh, with administrators, uh, Josh and Robin, and um, a school resource officer to address what would be the best course of action. We did get uh, quotes from a few different companies. This uh, vape detector quote is from the company Halo. Uh, this would be asking for 16 vape detecting devices to be installed uh, in some bathrooms in the high school and some bathrooms in the middle school. We are adding the middle school to this request because uh, myself and Hillary meet with a student advisory uh, council of four freshmen, four sophomores, four juniors, and four seniors, and they share with us their perspective and what they believe is the good number of children they perceive engaging in vaping in the district, and they did uh, mention the middle school as well. Halo is probably the top of the line device. There are cheaper devices, um, but we think uh, 16 devices may be a split, I think, of uh, 10 and 6, John, is that something, right? We talked about 10 at the high school and 6 at the middle school, okay. Josh, is that something? Uh, and then um, using this as really a pilot study to collect data, this is another important element. Uh, the Halo device, working with Josh, working with day automation, I think I got that right, thank you, uh, would uh, then, the device would communicate to a camera, and the camera may be able to take pictures going into the um, bathroom and coming out of the bathroom, uh, so that it's easier for administrators to review the data to look for patterns of, of, uh, of misuse and uh, put together a proactive plan to address that misuse. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. The Youth Mental Health for Stage, sure, I'll talk about that today. The uh, health insurance, uh, Ruby is going to work with uh, Premier and we partners. partners to see whether or not um, that there is a uh, not a self-funded plan that we could use or re uh, review uh, in perhaps potential communications with SRP uh, as it contributes to bus drivers. We we find I know that you've reached out to Assured Partners. They're going to get back to you. I don't think they gave any updates on that. Um, I did speak with them late last week. They are uh, looking for information, um, well, collecting really the information. Um, I did give them a couple of details in reference to the number of employees, um, different options that we were willing to explore. So they'll bring that back and we will review it um, and then and see what our options really are. Um, it will take a joint effort, not just with the board saying yes, but um, with SRP uh, being open to possibly doing something a bit different than what happens for everybody else in their unit. Can, can, yeah, can we, so like some of these things, I would think would fit under like the COVID um, finances, right? Like almost, like, I know other districts have been able to use their COVID money to do, um, we do their weight from. They, they're relating that to, to that. Um, the web program, for me, I 100% believe it's like a social emotional program. So, could we use those funds to cover, you know, can we see a separate, so it's not just in the general budget, but these could go under this, so that we could see it? So, so technically, 
um, per the state outside of uh, probably uh, table requests as we learned through questions with them, a lot of this stuff could go under American Rescue. Okay. Um, the things that you are up against is if it's people and you're putting them in American Rescue, they need to come back in the general fund or you need to have a plan of action, meaning you're, you're letting someone go. So we take that into consideration as well. The other part is there was a plan that was initially submitted. So you have funds, though they look available, they are tied up for a future year to balance your general fund budget out as well. So we have, we still have a, um, and I'm gonna watch this. Who's uh, in for Jessica so we do, we actually have staff that are being paid out of American Rescue. One of the things that is happening behind the scenes is the plan for either hey, are we keeping this person, um, which for some staff it will be because they're teachers in uh, a general classroom. So we're planning for that. And for others, the position may be a long-term sub that we deem not to be necessary. So yes, it's great when things come up to say, we can put this in American Rescue. And I, I literally just did a review of this last week to say, what can we put in? What is a one-time expense right. that draws down from the grant right. without adding the funds to the general kind fund. Kind like budget. the gym, right? Like doing the gym, it's almost like a one-time fund. It, it is, but it's a large one, right? So it's a five-year plan. They want $15,000 each year for five years. So it's saying, hey, what did we plan to do already in the grant that we're saying now X that out to put this in? So th that's really what the problem is. It's it's because you have to spend the money right away, you won't have it. Is that what you're no, saying? No, the, so the funding source for um, American Rescue has to be spent by September 30th of 2024. So for the gym, instead of doing a five year plan, wouldn't it be something? Yes, if, front, if so you had the funds up front, right? So if I had if I have sixty thousand or seventy five thousand dollars in that grant that is not allocated for a program or service, then yes. If that money is not available, then I'm saying either we X that program. So right now, um, a perfect example for a program that happens out of American Rescue is our summer uh, program. It started with elementary, <coughs> and we also do it middle high school. That is budgeted in the American Rescue. I could say, hey, we're not going to do the summer program. We can do the gym. But what I am saying is I, I don't just have pots of money that are not allocated to other things. So it's really deciding which one is the more impact important factor to put there and allow to occur uh, and what could be something that is smaller long term. Does that make sense? What? So all the money in the rescue fund is already allocated? Yes, to it had to be. That was the requirement. So um, I don't know if the board remembers, um, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit too. Um, back when the funds were provided to school districts, American Rescue was the only grant that you had to provide a plan of action. You had to actually allow the community input and provide a plan of action of how you were going to spend every single dollar up front, right? It's a multi-year grant. You can't change it? You can. Okay. You can make changes. But in making those changes, something has to go out for something else to go in. Okay. So I, I am doing um, the review of those. Um, I did express that we talked about the uh, youth mental health first aid. Right. We are looking to see, maybe I thought uh, the salary was going to be paid out at 90, maybe the person left mid-year, so it's less than that. So I do play out those factors to get a rough estimate of what we're looking at, but there are things that are unknown, right? I'm making assumptions for what a summer program is gonna cost. High school could say to me tomorrow, hey, I need to add three additional teachers, this is what we're doing, and I, I need to be able to allow for that flexibility. So it's not to say it's a no, it's just hard to say at this moment, I have $75,000 to go towards this. So that's why we put it here in the, the general fund, and it could very well be, hey, the first year, we can funnel it into the grant, and then the plan of action is all those other years, the board is saying, yes, we want to commit to the additional four happening this way. Because thinking if the money is to be spent right away, and we're, or we use it, I'd rather use it to... If all of the money will be spent. 
Okay. I, I, Dr. Graham will tell you, all of the money yeah. will definitely be spent, right? Yeah. So, so we do have those discussions. I have discussions with the principals, what's going on, what are additional things you need. Um, and maybe it's more helpful if um, I provide some of that yeah, information. Yeah. It's, we do update it, but maybe just consolidating it and putting it on here as information yeah. would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. This looks very interesting movie. Is this the multi-year plan to improve the fitness center? Yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is the plan of action that um, was developed uh, by, I can't remember who we met with. It was a phys ed teachers, Mr. DeMarco, yes. uh, Mr. Murray, I think, yeah. Hillary, lots of people. Yes. Um, so there have been a bit of discussion, and I think um, the discussion actually began last year when there was a request uh, in reference to the fitness center. And it was a total dollar amount, and I think it was around like seventy-five or $80,000. Um, so it was definitely something that got moved into future consideration. Uh, those individuals did sit down. Um, they asked to have a meeting to sit down to see what can we do and how can we make this a possibility. And they went back to the drawing board and developed a five-year plan. I literally took the information they put on their plan and I'm sharing it here um, with the board. The other part of this um, is as things are purchased, those things in the actual fitness center will then be declared obsolete. So there might be a little revenue uh, coming in from that, I can't promise it. And uh, funny enough, uh, this is a little off topic, but um, Patrick Smith, our food service director, was saying how on Auctions International, there was like a district that gave away an entire gym. So we will be looking at other options as well to see if anything pops up. It was only, it was like less than two grand. I was really mad that I didn't see it because we would have bought all their stuff. But um, this was their plan of action. Um, I, I think definitely in chunks like this, it is something that is doable. Um, any questions? No, I think this is great. It was a class. Oh, for sure. Did Mr. Antonelli get to look through and make sure the gym equipment is? He's done that in a couple other buildings, but I know he's very, very serious about the gym equipment. So it's got to be approved by Patrick. So, Ruby, we got uh, a multi year plan. I know today Hillary brought the board on a tour. We stopped at the tech department. We heard from Mr. Patman all the needs that they have. And this spells out a, a, five, a four year plan. Five. Five. Uh, yeah, five year plan. Five year plan. Um, and I took, so they provided me with all the information. I kind of did a, one replacement here, another replacement the following year. And my thought process was they wanted to get diverse stuff um, in their grass instead of getting the same item, two of them, right away. Um, and we put this forth. It is, it's hefty. Um, there is a lot of technology down there, um, high-tech machines and equipment, um, but we felt that this was a solid plan of action to get that to occur, as well as some discussions that we're having with our grant writers to see if there's any uh, assistance we can get from them and any, you know, assistance that Dr. Graham may have. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we may look at this or other uh, items to, to uh, speak to our Senate representative in Albany to see if there are some DAS need grants yes. that uh, could support some of this equipment. Yes. So that you know, that will be coming down the pipeline. Yeah. In the next few weeks. Yes. Right. Yeah, this slide did change, right? Uh huh. <laughs> so uh, there are a couple of changes, um, as we always do with the first one. It's it's everyone's wish list items, right? Um, so we went from requesting uh, five 65 passenger buses to three, and from requesting two 29 passenger buses to one. Um, the Ford F-350s has remained the same, but um, taking into consideration the cost for three of the larger buses, one small bus, and then the two uh, trucks, it brings us right around where we are right now. <coughs> yes. Well, and I, I do like to say that I, I take everyone's request as they stand and we put them here. And um, just so you're aware, we do have offline discussions about 
what is the rationale, what does the future hold, uh, and the longevity in that. And that brings me to um, the next request that was given at the last board meeting was to see other school districts and basically what the size of their fleet is, what is their replacement plan, um, how they're rotating vehicles, and I also asked the electric bus question. So yeah, maybe I can you. answer that for this Well, meeting. thank you for asking. And remember, the, you, the board may remember that Lakeshore got a grant to purchase an EV bus, so it was no cost to the district. Now, in this year's budget, they're, they are asking their uh, constituents to vote on a 71 passenger EV bus. So right now, though, they're the only one that you can log? Yes, they were the only um, district that replied. Uh, yes, out of the districts that did. And I did think it was, I highlight, well, I didn't highlight them, I bolded them. Um, districts that were similar in bus fleet size and how many they are replacing each year and what their cycle is. So we are on um, par and, and what our plan of action is as well. Um, I think this will look a lot different in five to 10 years when we're talking uh, electric buses and, and how those cycle, but for right now, this is what they're doing. <coughs> and this provided, sorry, Dr. Yeah, okay. um, this provided some warranty coverages. I believe there were questions about warranty, so I just kind of listed this here. Um, I don't remember fully what those questions were, so I hope this captures what was being asked in reference to that. I think there was a reference to what, you know, you know how your car comes out of warranty, you can purchase any additional, additional whatever. Yes. I think if I remember correctly, actually was your question, right? I believe that was kind of what the cost of that was. And then this also lists the um, buses that will be declared obsolete. I did go back and ask if we were only purchasing uh, three larger buses and one smaller. Does that then change what we declare obsolete? And it did not change the list. Um, with the warranty, Ashley, did I misinterpret it? I, I think my whether or not we're um, determining obsolete with buses that currently have warranties. We wouldn't do that, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're checking the odometer and of course it, 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 there's a lot of the warranty for the model. I think the only time um, the only time you run into like a weird issue is when you kind of just get a crappy bus. Um, that happens, right? I hate to say it but it does happen. Um, so what would happen is uh, Teresa would probably use that more for on island short little uh, runs where you're, you're not using it to draw out tons of mileage because then it's going into repair uh, a lot more often and then she'd wait and then it would become obsolete upon that time, but yes. So we're not changing our schedule one? No. You don't, change, you don't change them out as soon as the warranty is up? They are on a rotation cycle, so um, you'll see that some of these are 2012. Um, I think last year we might have even had some 2010, so it was beyond the warranty cycle. Um, but it's really what is the uh, use life of the bus, how often is it going out for repairs, those things are taken into consideration. So there are vehicles that we have kept well beyond, and then there are some that the warranties of the bus is it's not running well, um, it's constantly being serviced by our maintenance guys, and the amount of money we're pouring into it to repair it is not worth the bus. So then we um, would put the, we then take the bus and we would put it on uh, Auctions International, which is um, listed uh, on the next slide with some information. Um, so I'll do Auctions International and then I'll uh, touch on the, the truck. So this was a, five-year review, um, all of this information is actually public information as well. I've, I found it through a little bit of additional searching uh, to make sure it break, broke out properly um, with what we recorded in our financial system. But it shows you the vehicle um, and a little descriptor as well as the amount of money that we received. So this is all revenue that was brought into the school district by um, auctioning off buses and trucks. trucks had a bigger bang for your buck um, than the buses do, but uh, you'll see in this school year that the buses went for quite a bit more than what they usually do. 
And then I also know that there was a question in reference to trucks and the mileage um, on them, so that is listed as well. I don't know if there are questions beyond just wanting to see the information. We're good? Okay. Okay. Ruby, I know that this slide was shown. Yes, the it's the same. Okay. But it's important, right? This is establishing a capital reserve, which will allow us to contemplate a capital project in the future, perhaps by putting some funds in this to help offset the tax burden. Very well. Thank you. <laughs> Can you explain it a little bit more? I don't sure. understand. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I actually don't understand it at all. Dang it. <laughs> um, so basically what happens um, when you have a capital project, you build the capital project, it's presented to the board, it will get to the point where if the board is saying, yes, let's move forward with this project, we will work with legal, we advertise that project, and then it goes out to the voters the same way a budget goes out. Um, well, you get a bond for it, right? You basically get a loan for it. Yes. So, so what happens, though, when you have a capital reserve, it means that you're not taking as much money out for a loan, which means that you are relieving the burden, the burden off your taxpayers or off your community because you're saying, hey, throughout so many years we've set aside money to cover some of the cost of this project. You're still, unless, unless you're like really swimming in, in cash, right? Um, but most times you can't say, hey, I'm not going to take out a bond to do the project. So there's always some type of debt, but it lessens the debt, which then has an impact on the tax cap calculation. But you get that money back. Right, like You're state aided, but state aid is not 100%, so you do not get all that money back. Well, we there's, there's really two steps. The first step is we have to establish by vote the ability to have a reserve. Okay, right now we do. You do have to? Um, we don't have to, but if we, if we, if we, the first step is to establish the reserve. Okay, that's the vote that's required by the public. Okay, then it, putting the money into the reserve is step two. Correct, and then taking the money out of the reserve, which also requires a vote when the capital project is voted on, they would also vote in uh, theory that yes, you can use funds from the capital reserve. It's written, it's, it's lengthy, but it's written all within that language um, to allow for the use. So if you do not establish a capital reserve, you're really just saying to the community that whatever the state does not pay, you're going to pick up. Right, but you're lessening it. So if I'm going to purchase a house and I go in and I don't have any money to put down on that house, I pay the full amount right then and there. If I had $20,000 to put down on the house, what I'm paying or what is being contributed for me month to month changes. So it's it's same in the theory of, let's say you have a project that's $5 million, and let's say the state is saying, I'm going to age you 90%, 10% falls on the taxpayer. But if you have money set aside in the reserve, what would fall on the taxpayer you're actually covering with the reserve funds? It's just, like, let's say it's a $20 million project. Okay. So they cover 80% of the project. Maybe a little less, but... Yeah. You're asking for ten million as the option to fund over fifteen years. So in the in in theory, what um, any school district should be doing is constant capital projects. You should not be waiting 15 years to do a capital project. That's how you get into having to do 60 and $70 million projects, which are heavy hitters for school districts. So by saying, hey, we are looking to be able to establish a reserve, the maximum amount that we can put in this reserve is $10 million, and the life of putting the funds in there is 15 years. So we don't have, to, I don't have 10 million, million off to the side to say, yeah, we don't reserve opens, you put the money in. But over, 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> so over a period of time, it could very well be in the next one or two years we come to the board, you know, with an idea for a capital project, right? We may only have a million in there. In there, not ten million. So that one million dollars would offset the total cost, right? Or the cost of the right because it's like project. eight million is like the two. Well, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, the more you can put in the reserve, the better so for you're the taxpayers. You're saying you're getting it so that you can multiple projects down there. Sure, right? absolutely. Well, yes. yeah, yeah, it'll grow. I mean, if you time. if you had ten million and you could put it towards a project, that project. would be something yeah, that right. the board would have to say yes, we think this is a good idea, or split it up because we foresee a couple different projects. Right. It's, it's one of the differences with the capital reserve fund is we have to have a vote of the, 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 the district, okay, of, the, of the taxpayers, to even establish the right to put dollars in Correct. there. Correct. Okay. Okay. Right now, we did have one many years ago. It has expired, so we can't, we can no longer even contemplate putting, putting money in into in such a fund because right. we don't have a fund established. This vote will allow us to establish the fund. Right? Yes. Out, essentially. But it will be empty at, at the beginning until we start putting money in there. Correct. So and it's not like a... Million. No. And no. it's not a rolling $10 million, right? right? It's not like you get to put $10 million in, you lose two, let me put the other two back in. That's not how it works. $10 million is the maximum, and then uh, once you spend that down and it's zeroed out, then you are going back to the taxpayers saying, we'd like to establish a new capital reserve, this is what it's for. This is the length of time. Good questions. So, and you'll see this slide again. I mean, this will yes. be here the next time we present. So, if there's additional questions, we can certainly address those. Mm -hmm. All right. Any major changes here? This, the changes really just reflect the salary um, changes that have occurred, as well as any health insurance. Uh, and benefit changes. So all of that information you saw before has just trickled into this report to give a, a broader view. The with request language was <coughs> higher the last time we presented the board, right? Oh, yes. And that is now board. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the slide that you were looking for last meeting, Sue, uh, in reference to fund balance. So um, <laughs> every uh, at least by March of each year, you do have to make sure that you are showing publicly um, where your fund balance is. You will see that the fund balance as of June 30th, 2022 and March 31st of 2023 don't usually change um, for Grand Island. We're not usually using reserve funds um, mid-year unless something major happens, which doesn't usually occur. So um, the major areas where you will see fund balance is our debt service reserve, we also um, have been funding our employee benefit, accrual liability, and the ERS reserve. Um, TRS is an area um, on here that in the future it is our hope to begin to fund that as well as the self-funded uh, health insurance reserve. Um, right now we've been performing okay, so it hasn't been anything that's a, a red or highlighted area for me. but. Um, as we move forward, I think these would be things that the auditors would just be saying, hey, districts are allowed to have them now, start funding them. Well, actually, you and I and some of our colleagues fought for that. Yes. And we got it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> even if it's a dollar, <laughs> put something in there. Um, and uh, another thing that I know um, is requested every year by school districts, and I know it will be requested again, is in reference to school districts being limited to 4% fund balance, um, the state is allowed 15%, so we're kind of like, hey, the state gets 15, can't we just be allowed 10? Um, that just allows for, you know, more rainy day funds, if you really think about what 4% is on an overall budget, it's really not even covering a month to two months of um, expenses. So if you were ever in a real issue, the funds are not there to, to really support that. So. We continue to push for that, but um, this shows you where we were for the last couple of years, where we are as of March 31st, and um, anticipated are just some of the norms that we've seen or past trends 
if the budget performs better than what we anticipate, then a lot of these funding areas won't even be tapped into. Hopefully, we'll just be putting more funds in. So, um, Sherry, for you, these are very similar to the capital reserve, except for they're established. A lot of them do not have limits, so it becomes something that is reviewed with the board once the audit happens, and the board is saying, yes, and we move forward. Capital just functions differently in reference to taxpayers need to vote on it. There needs to be a max. Um, there is a number of years it can be established for, and then taxpayers vote to draw that money out. Most other reserves, it's simply a discussion with the Board of Education. Isn't there, one, isn't there a certain percentage that they like to stay around reserves? Do you get too much in the reserves? So 4% is fund balance. Reserves really are district specific. Um, they come in, they will review where your expenses have been, so the size of your district and that budget area can definitely throw some um, red flag. So if you have a, let's say we had a health insurance self-funded reserve, and let's say we had 30 million in there, I can guarantee you the state would come in and say to, say to us, well you only spend 10 million a year. Why do you have so much money in there that you need to either move that into a different reserve, um, spend it down, give the money back to taxpayers, I do like to say that, uh, in some of their audits as well. So um, those are things they look for. They look for a percentage of what you're actually spending in that area and what you're putting in your reserve to, to protect you. Any other questions? Not a problem. <clears throat> Nothing has changed um, on the calculation. Uh, we did submit it. It was due March 1st uh, every, every year, so this has been submitted to the Office of State Comptroller. Um, that does not you know, uh, prohibit the board from making any adjustments or suggestions, but it just requires that your information is put in there. And then we also check the box that we do not anticipate exceeding uh, the tax cap. Nothing here has changed either. Um, we always like to show this slide just in reference to the uh, dollar amount change. So it is, we're anticipating a 56 cents increase, and that is 3.33% um, of an increase from the 22-23 um, levy amount. And then you will also see down here, we always like to show what we actually projected during those years versus what actually uh, it came into being. So I always think that's important to show too. And um, that is based on the overall assessed value of the item. The only thing yep. I just mentioned, sure. thing. okay, so um, in the upcoming meeting, something that will be a little bit different is um, we have a foundation aid survey that went out to the parents, to <coughs> students, and to staff to complete. If you have not completed, please do so, because I'm going to be looking at that uh, probably by the end of the week. Um, that was required based on the percentage increase we received this year well, the upcoming year for Foundation Aid. I will show um, those survey results probably in some like graphics, and that um, information is supposed to be used to help direct and guide some of your um, selected areas to spend Foundation Aid funds in. Um, some of them already do that, which is great, and other things just maybe uh, things to earmark or have a discussion around, but I did want to share that. So the extra foundation aid that we're getting, is that, do you already have that in the budget? Like, <coughs> right. With yes. that aid, we're, we're still short, that's... Yes. Unless they give us more. <laughs> Which <thing>? Right. <laughs> I don't foresee that one happening. Thank you. I think that concludes our yes. presentation. So Sherry, very typically to start with a big gap, right? We see the whole wish list and then they work to get it done. So by the time we come to our last meeting, it will be balanced. So this is very typical and we as a board like to see everything in line, not just what they pick. So it's a great it's a great process for us to be able to see. Isn't just confused that we're getting extra two million and then we'll be yeah. 
you know what that means. Do you know what I mean? Like, I guess I'm confused. And I know oh. if you ever want to sit with me, to go over some of those things, I might be oh, very sure. happy to do okay. Thank you. That brings us to the superintendent's report. <laughs> I did not put any slides together because you know, we had 122 to review. I do want to uh, wish Sue Marston a happy birthday. So let's give her a little clap. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it is not. And you know, you heard from our student ambassadors, lot, lots to celebrate. So, how wonderful was it to have uh, the brother and sister team here representing us in states and how proud they are and the good work that they do with our coaches and our volunteer coaches, Stacey Schwab and Lott is uh, one of the volunteer coaches, as you know, she's a champion herself in the throwing uh, events for track and field. And, she uh, provided a lot of support to our kids. Uh, Mike Loria, Amy McMahon, Gene Percival, Sandy Lamb, John Fitzpatrick, and Rachel Graybeck did a great job getting ready for our staff development day last week, so thank you to all of them for all of their contributions. You heard about Eden Johnson, Andrew Burke, and Madeline Cordeo, who are our DECA uh, com competitors who are, have been uh, in, uh, have won to the point where they're advancing to the national competition, so we'll wait and see if that comes to fruition for them. Our elementary PE teachers work with our administrators to put together an elementary 3v3 basketball tournament last Saturday. It was absolutely outstanding, and uh, I'm sure there may have been some side wagers between the people that were buying and how all, all that flowed, but it was a lot of, a lot of fun. I'm so proud of the kids. And uh, we'll see if Felicia has a, like a broken finger and she couldn't shoot the three-pointers, but maybe next year. And you heard about our chess team performing amazingly well, and Jude is working with some of the teachers to bring them back for some special recognition. I had the pleasure of working with Tom Franz on February 15th to talk about the gun safety presentation that we received earlier in the year. Um, our school resource officers, in combination with our library media specialists, are going to put together a plan uh, so that uh, they can be some of the people delivering the safety messages to our kids, including gun safety and other areas of safety. I think Tom, uh, as the officer in charge of Grand Island Police, sees that their school, the school resource officers are really excited about putting together their own plan. That might mean that we may not be, you know, purchasing or working with an iron entry, but it makes a lot of sense uh, for our team to put that together. Uh, so we may see a plan in place next year where school resource officers are working with their principals to do presentations to kids on overall safety, playground safety, bicycle safety, gun safety, and so on. Uh, river safety, right? Yeah. Uh, I do want to thank Mrs. Pizzer. She communicated with me over the weekend about her concerns regarding the elementary band field trip that's coming up in April, so I'm grateful to her for her communication. I'm particularly grateful to our band teachers working with our principals and Teresa and Lisa Day to put together a plan. I think that plan is excellent, and uh, we're going to be looking forward to those kids uh, performing in Rochester in April. So thank you to everybody involved for helping put that together. And uh, last but not least, I do, I, I can't stress this enough, this board is excellent. This board tonight approved the district's request to increase um, support for bus drivers, substitute bus drivers, bus drivers in training, people looking to get their CEL. For the first time ever in my seven years, we're moving from $15 an hour to $19 an hour for the first 20 days of bus substitute coverage. And then after those 20 days, they'll jump from $19 an hour to $21.88 an hour, which is what's been approved with the SRP contract. And for the first time ever, we will be paying CEL trainees to get up to 30 <coughs> hours of training at $16 an hour, capped at 30 hours. And th those monies won't be given out immediately, but at the end of the training, successful training, 
will put together a process so that those people interested in being drivers will get paid for the training, which is the first time ever, and maybe the first time in, out of a lot of districts. And I'm not aware of Ruby if this is happening, if, we're, if other districts are. <laughs> but I can't emphasize enough that this board supports uh, this type of uh, incentive. Uh, Mr. Loria is working with radio stations and has put together another plan to uh, broadcast through radio advertising the openings and the vacancies in our district. The video that we put together has had over 1,300 views, which means that people are watching and looking and will continue to market these opportunities. So those two approvals will allow the district to really compete for new bus drivers. So I thank the board uh, really for that action tonight. Uh, furthermore, um, Ruby and I will be meeting with the before and after school program that is currently in place here in the district to work out a deal that if we are successful in attracting a young father or a young mother to be a bus driver and they have school-age children, we are going to make a deal that those school-age children that go to our schools will get free before and after school um, child care through the vendor that works with us currently. So imagine you're a new bus driver and you're a young dad or a young mom and you have to be at work at 6.15 to start your route at 6.30 to go pick up our middle school and high school students. You now will have an opportunity to drop off your school age child to our before school vendor uh, and have know that your children are safe and being cared for while you report to work uh, to get on your route by 6.30. This will be another benefit for Grand Island residents to consider becoming bus drivers here with our district. So those three benefits alone, I think I'm really excited about. Does the board have any questions about that? So I thank you very much. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the Board of Education report uh, with a couple of reports from Sue. Just real quick, um, everybody knows the golf tournament for Gisla is July 17th. We are adding a new um, fundraiser uh, to the 2024 calendar. So in addition to a golf tournament, we will be doing um, a car show here at the high school middle school um, complex. So stay tuned for that. It's pretty exciting. I know um, one of our teachers has a garage full of multiple cars. He's very excited to be able to show them on the island. So. Um, I think we'll see that in 2024. Um, just real quick on our joint town uh, board school board wellness, wellness committee. Um, we had an excellent meeting uh, just last week. And um, a couple things just to go over. We recapped all of the questions that came from our November 2022 presentation. Went through all the questions that um, were given by the parents. Uh, we successfully, we believe, have um, looked at their concerns and come up with and changed things. And we will be reporting that out as soon as I get the email with um, who those people were with the questions. And then before the end of the year, we're going to do a year on review. Probably in May. We're going to make sure that we get them put up early there and talk to just today. So a newsletter kind of recapping where we started in the year, what's been added, services. Um, some of the stuff will be redundant to those that have asked questions at the wellness um, presentation in November, but we really feel they need you know, the information as soon as we can provide it. So really awesome, right? I think a great newsletter is an excellent addition. Um, Ann Nowak um, joined us as our uh, parent um, representative for the first time, and it was excellent to have her there. She was very welcome by all. We are looking to change our name. I, I don't know who will support. There you go. Family support services for the child. You still can see the name of another name in the screen. Yes, I mentioned it. Are you something we can talk about? We don't have anything scheduled at this time. 
That's all I have. So shared for them. Well, he just. I like it. <laughs> Um, did you not get it? I this one about the, the district wellness community. I sent stuff in last Yeah, we're doing a lot. It sounds like the question is if you're on that district wellness committee, you would have some documents to share with you that would be on the future reports. Okay. Right? Is there a date coming up that you want to yeah, announce? So, Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. Okay. yeah, yeah. So April 19th, we're going to do a wellness fair. It's going to be um, like pre-K to uh, 12th grade. We'll invite the entire community to come and see. Um, we invite lots of the vendors to come in, and it'll be like um, a physical well-being, emotional well-being, mental well-being. Um, we have a lot of services coming in too that people can just go to the tables and talk to them. But we also have like um, other vendors like. Grand Island Dance, soccer programs, um, we have defense programs, we, we have a lot of um, just interactive like pickleball where they can actually try it. Um, so we want it to be very interactive programs for all of them kids can be involved. So it's about physical activity, but mental activity as well, yoga, um, mindfulness, like different rooms throughout the entire high school um, that parents can kind of go around and visit and then maybe even join those clubs just to get active with their kids um, and use the Grand Island community. So I want to thank Mr. Anthony. Um, he's had like incredible ideas. He's like every time he talks, I'm like, yep, let's do that. Yeah. So he's he's really on board um, with physical and emotional well-being of kids. So I really appreciate that. Mr. Buffman has been really wonderful. Um, I can go to him and say I, I don't know how to do this. Can you add this? And it does immediately. So um, the physical education teachers have been really really big on it. So the the whole group that I'm part of has just been really wonderful and I'm excited for this um, wellness trip. Awesome. Okay, thank you. A um, couple questions. How much is it to join the golf tournament? Who do they contact and how many people per team? Just in case we have people out there listening and just want to go back to the golf tournament. Um, I know July 17th, Stuart said. So just how many people usually per team, the cost, and Contact. So there's a four person team. Yeah. However, you can sign up individually. It's $125 per person. One, per one, 150. Yeah. 150. Yeah. 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 150 includes lunch and dinner. Yeah. Includes a golf cart. Yep. 150 includes lunch and dinner, the 18 holes, the golf cart, and the driving range. So it's a, it's a good deal. And um, Jude is the contact. Great, great. And it is a good time, whether you're really good or not. Yes, that's important. You can just go for dinner and join into the raffles. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess that's that. And then public comment session, we did not have anyone sign up for that. Uh, committee of the whole, items and information that are on the table, starting with one. I got them. The bazaar was amazing um, at Youth. They did an amazing job, and um, the bounce houses were incredible. But just everything that went on, it was a lot of fun. The kids really enjoyed it. And then actually, I had a really good time with you at DACA to see the behind the scenes and all the work that the kids put in. I was blown away. I actually had no idea what DACA did. So when I got there, they give them scenarios that they have to solve in like 10 minutes. And I was like, oh, let me see the scenario. It's probably something like cute or little. It was so in depth. I couldn't. I was like, I wouldn't be able to solve this. So the things these kids do is just incredible. So I really enjoyed like that. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you to our business teachers. I know Mrs. Chamberlain, Mrs. Boutte, Mr. Simpson was there. Um, I know it's not Miss Wills anymore, but I want to say Miss Wills. Um, but for all of our business teachers that put so much time, effort, and energy into organizing um, with the DECA event. It was wonderful to see behind the scenes and very exciting. And um, congratulations to all of our participants and students attending nationals. And um, that's it, Sue. So. I just want to say that I went to the uh, band concert on Thursday night and uh, Mr. Reed, our preschool um, band instructor, um, had the first chair clarinet player from the BPO perform a solo and perform with our children along with Mr. Robertson, um, who was our Pegamine music teacher, um, John Reed's wife, um, also played the French horn that night. 
and Mr. Ellis was on the string bass. If you have a chance to go and listen to the performance, um, it's just fantastic. And it's, it was such an excellent opportunity for us as parents and families to see someone from the BPO perform, but for our students to be on stage and work right alongside of them, it was really fantastic. Um, and I know Mark recorded it, I recorded it, so it, it really would be a great, um, great thing to go back and, and listen to. It's one of my favorite concerts. They showcase elementary right through to high school. It's so awesome to remember where we started and where we are today. And at all levels, our music program is fantastic. So kudos to everyone. That's all. My mom's asking. I'm all set. I'm all set too. Thank you. March 27th, uh, next budget meeting, and no? Well, I'm just remembering <laughs> you guys. And um, congrats to Kegavine for winning uh, the basketball <laughs> tournament. And I think I'm going to like coach one of these future games because it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Just uh, my Apple Watch just gave me a bedtime reminder. <laughs> Yours too. We should we should pay attention. I do. Uh, so we just talked about that band concert. Do you have it right there? If you go to our website and scroll down to local live, you'll be able to find that concert right here. <laughs> Thank you.